Nasr Said, could you run the video, please? Could you run the video? ممكن تمشوا فيديو؟ ممكن تشغلوا فيديو؟ and innovations in the field of diabetic food. I would like to thank Professor uh, Nasser Saeed and the organizing committee for allowing me to organize this session. And I would like to welcome our distinguished foreign uh, guests, Dr. Uh, Alexander Lazaro and Dr. Giacomo uh, Clerici from Italy, and our national faculty, uh, Dr. Ihab Nabil from the National Institute of Diabetes and Neurology, and Dr. Fadi Mshil, uh, from uh, Inchams University. Uh, please, Dr. Ihab Nabil, come to the podium. Uh, and I would like to call our uh, co-chairpersons, Professor Ahmed Hassin, uh, Professor Gabriel Pifaretti from Italy, Professor Hossam Taufi, and Professor Walid El Bez. Please come to the podium. And now, and now we could start. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Alexander Lozarov. He is from Bulgaria. He teaches the philosophy of artificial intelligence in Sofia University. Please. Thank you. 
Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank Professor Nasser Al Said and Professor Bishara for granting me the chance to deliver a presentation before you today and for their braveness to involve a purely non-medical person to a medical event. We are experiencing an interdisciplinary era. So, I'm about to comment on artificial intelligence that is already in play now, in this very moment, that you can reach it both with your smartphones and uh, various other devices. It is available in uh, human supervised and non-supervised versions and it's uh, named narrow artificial intelligence. Narrow means very, very highly specialized. So my target today is to bring you some basic awareness on uh, the, its nature and its uh, principles of operation as to encourage you to employ it and I hope that some 10 minutes ahead, every one of you could uh, make an assessment whether this is uh, some new type of our instrumentation, our assistant and partner, our collaborator, an opponent, a competitor, the set of all that or something else. And besides, you'll know why philosophy is involved to all that. I will start with the diversity between robots and AI because uh, perhaps due to science fiction, people immediately re relate AI to robots, but that's just partially true. Robots are, uh, in fact, computer systems periphery. They only perform or transform what AI has generated. And uh, in, to better understand that, the robot is just the actor well, AI is the scriptwriter, the command center, and if dealing dedicated to speech recognition, to medical diagnostics, to language to language interpretation, uh, AI does not at all need a robot. It only needs a display or a network to present you what it has generated. Now, let's spare a minute for the digital bit. Uh, all of you know that these are long lines of sets of zeros and ones. One signifies yes and zero encodes no to a certain question. But attention please, <coughs> here is a question. So there is a philosophical query. Who or which was the agency that has raised that question? And besides, who and how detected the answer and made the assessment of whether it is a positive or a negative one? In the case of uh, medical diagnostics AI, this means that you should always uh, bear in mind who has developed this type of uh, this algorithm, uh, was there any medical expertise involved to its creation or at least to its certification. Now apparently, as you read about uh, AI, you always meet a triple term that says uh, deep learning of big data via neural networks. The neural networks are a specific type of uh, hardware of processing unit and I will skip commenting on that due to the time frame. But uh, the big data and deep learning uh, are a really challenging phenomena. Uh, it has three typical features. The first one is shown in its name is uh, being big. These are enormous tremendous lines of uh, uh, data that no human can ever uh, memorize, detect, consider, think about. Well, the computers already can do that. Besides, uh, big uh, data is characterized <coughs> by the fact that these are real-time data streams. They are not structured, they are not memorized. And finally, a big data set in any event involves at least two flows having heterogeneous origin. A minute ahead, you'll know why. So here comes the logical question, what is intelligence and can it be artificial? Uh, there are a lot of narratives uh, on what is intelligence suggested by both philosophy and uh, psychology and yet uh, there is no agreeable one. However, once commenting on artificial intelligence, in any event, we have in mind uh, its capacity to autonomously generate successful predictions. 
and successful means that these predictions really happen on a time horizon ahead, and autonomously is just the opposite of externally driven. So, as we are commenting on uh, uh, prognos prognostic capacities, let's uh, think about how we humans create our hypotheses. We involve what we have in our memory, I mean knowledge uh, accumulated either by theory or by experience. Thus we know physical laws and some principles of social behavior. We involve logic and we have an outcome. Classical computers can do the same because any rule, any law can be presented either as a function, either as an equation, and then it applies mathematical logic and statistical methods. Careful, statistics means that your patients in medical diagnostics are treated as entities, not as subjects. However, apparent AI solutions can do something in addition that we cannot manage. By observing the big data sets, uh, streams, if it finds out uh, digital patterns which represent either correlations or interactions or process development stages, it uh, uh, determines them and, for example, if there are uh, stages A, B, C, D, E in the first flow and common, similar phases A, B, C, D in the second one, they, uh, AI immediately concludes that there will emerge an E phase in the second flow. Importantly, it cannot uh, find out uh, the uh, cause event line. It cannot tell you why this will happen. Yet, its forecasts are successful and uh, it calculates the probability of this uh, event happening. Uh, it is very essential here to say that the ABCD example is a very simple one, but uh, there are cases when in the one flow there are detected 900 uh, uh, stages, in the other one 890 uh, common uh, events, so the probability is uh, highly raised immediately, and besides, you know, not just a single step ahead, but 10. So, this is the intelligent procedure. The time frame does not allow me to get in detail here. Please remember that it is a four-step uh, line which is more or less common and similar between humans and AI. And this is my, sli my last slide, and this is the very essential one. Uh, now, if you create an idea, you have uh, an idea, uh, it, is, it is purely yours, and uh, it is absolutely under your control and your will whether to make it accessible to others or to keep it for in privacy, in your memory. If you decide to make it accessible to others, you have two options. Either to perform it virtually, that means you tell it to someone, you deliver a presentation, you write a book, you make a piece uh, of art or whatever. Importantly, the performance does never cause any uh, consequences in the physical and social environment. It is just a data exchange. But also importantly, there must be involved at least a second intelligent body uh, to perceive the appeal. A performance with no audience, a book that is uh, not read, is a nonsense. It is uh, just the opposite with the transforms. If my idea is to break this door, I take a big hammer, I push it, it breaks into pieces, and there is no matter whether somebody has watched me or not. Now, how is this related to AI? This is the so-called black box phenomenon. Uh, AI creates a lot of production and we cannot uh, uh, observe neither the data input nor the data processing stages because big data is involved and we cannot manage it. So we are in a blind passive position to be presented what it generated. And uh, what I can uh, suggest, and it is uh, generally recommended, 
once dealing with AI, we must uh, ask as many questions as possible. We must uh, make as many simulations and tests as possible just to get ensured <coughs> that we have squeezed out the very maximum of its production. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. We, we need to know, to know a lot more about artificial intelligence. Now, I would like to present my colleague, uh, Dr. Ihab Nabil, who is the Dean uh, of the National Institute uh, of um, Diabetes and Endocrinology. He is going to uh, talk about a new aspect of uh, wound care, and that is ventilation and weaning from VAC. Dr. Ihab. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, dear uh, professors. I would like to start by thanking Dr. Nasser uh, Said for the excellent and outstanding uh, preparation for such a beloved meeting that we all care to attend. Uh, well, uh, the title of my uh, presentation is Ventilation and Weaning from Vacuum. Yes, indeed, I mean ventilation because in uh, wound care management, uh, in cardiac surgeons, they consider ventilation in open heart surgeries, lung surgeries, they ventilate the wound itself by carbon dioxide to limit the infection at all days. And also, knowing the vacuum as a weapon to salvage our limbs is very important, and it's important to know when to stop it and wean the patient from the vacuum usage. Uh, in, in fact, limb salvage is as important as life salvage, but comes next after the life salvage. We have to mix and match and create all our uh, master scene in case we have a very unsalvageable feet with severe infection, peripheral arterial occlusive disease, diabetic, in presence of infection and raised serum cariats, we are obliged first to debride and clean our wounds prior to start with angioplasty for such patients. Such a debridement would end in a very uh, dangerous wound that needs salvageability. This salvageability could occur by First, revascularization and uh, full revascularization should be attempted as much as possible. I won't go through this, but yet the advancement and the technologies help much in wires and in revascularization techniques to achieve full revascularization distal as possible to achieve adequate blood su ample supply. Then we opt for going for a vacuum treatment. Vacuum treatment could go endlessly, but we should be very uh, judgeful uh, not to jeopardize the limb by excessive usage and excessive moisture or in presence of infection. So the guidelines ensures not more than four weeks usage of vacuum. <coughs> After this usage of vacuum, we need to ventilate the wound. And now we have a new ventilation methodology. That's the oxygen carrying uh, sprays that's carry the oxygen on hemoglobin, on hemoglobin, particularly in the vicinity of the wound itself. So we can use something like granulox to ventilate the wound itself and carry more oxygen to the vicinity of the wound, thus more supplying more oxygen, more ample uh, uh, ventilation to the wound itself until it reaches full granulation and thus it is salvageable and functioning. Another example is the heal wound that never heals. We are still apply all the, what we have mentioned from revascularization. Here we have exposed all the calcaneus. Then we can use the vacuum for eight weeks, uh, four weeks, I'm sorry, and then ventilated by uh, uh, granulox till full granulation. Other examples are showing the same idea, not e only in diabetic feet, not only in exposed tendons that we can use this and we granulate in diabetic feet, uh, vicinity, but also uh, all non salvage rule. We if we apply the same technique, we achieve the same results with full healing and functionality of the wound. Even for venous aspect, we can apply the vacuum for venous ulcers. Such long lasting venous ulcer could get four weeks of uh, vacuum, then granulox, it's completely closed and completely healing after years of non healing. The message about this is that we are advancing in the field of vacuum therapy, advancing in the field of impregnation of the wound by oxygen in form of granulox, 
adding these two together, we mentioned what we are here for today, that's the advancement in tools, advancement in uh, techniques, as well as also in lymphedema, we can apply vacuum, we can get better wound healing. This slide is meant to be left white and clear for the next year, where we will find more applications and more tools and more, much, much more uh, mobile applications that could clearly judge the wound, clearly help in wound healing, and clearly the artificial intelligence is coming in real life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yeb. I'm sure this will excite lots of questions. May I have the honor to uh, present a further beyond what I have said, that's uh, new options for low option patients. Uh, I would love to present, I was honored, Professor uh, Giacomo uh, Glerici, a known diabetic food surgeon, member of the board of the International Association of Diabetic Food Surgeons, a polyclinic of uh, Abano Term and Hospital San Carlo Milan. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, chairpersons, of course. Uh, first of all, let me thank the president, uh, the uh, members of the scientific committee for this kind of invitation, in particular, a good friend of mine, uh, Rashad Bishara, uh, for uh, these beautiful days in, uh, in Urgada. So, uh, I do not have any conflict of interest to declare about this lecture. And I would like to share with you a clinical case we faced uh, uh, a few months ago about a seven, five years old type two diabetes patient with neuropathy, with uh, pacemaker, hypertension, chronic kidney, kidney disease, stage three, who underwent uh, previous revascularization of the peroneal artery with Marco Manzi, Mariano Palen, I work, uh, I am very <laughs> lucky because I am a foot surgeon and I work uh, with the very three monsters in the interventional uh, uh, world field, uh, Marco Manzi, Mariano Palen and Roberto Ferraresi. But uh, they found a very bad situation because uh, this patient uh, had a, a sad small artery disease with severe calcification and uh, they, st they tried in April, but in May, this patient uh, still has uh, a rest pain, but unfortunately with uh, gangrene of the first and second toe. So rest pain with uh, foot gangrene, uh, prop to bone positive uh, in, the, in the forefoot, uh, and with these uh, uh, angiographic findings, you can see that we have a very uh, we call it desert foot, desert foot uh, without, if you look at in the right bottom, you can see even the perfusion is completely uh, down. And uh, the TCPO2 was uh, 16 millimeters of mercury. So uh, we thought about uh, another option. So uh, we published uh, a few papers about the hybrid uh, vein arterialization, but unfortunately this, patient's, uh, this patient has uh, some problem with the vein because uh, he had uh, uh, a previous uh, coronary artery bypass graft. And so uh, a few weeks uh, before uh, visiting this patient, I met these two guys. Uh, somewhere in the, around the world uh, in a conference, they talked uh, to me about uh, a new device, the transverse tibial bone transport with the TTT system. And uh, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Elisa of Technique with uh, external fixation with uh, hardware or something like that. But this uh, device uh, is uh, the uh, rational behind this device is that the tibial cortex transverse transport surgery is based on the elixir of low of tension stress, uh, which states that slow and gradual destruction of the bone activates and enhances the, the regenerative potential of living tissue. This is the surgical procedure, but we are going to see better in the, in the next uh, few slides. 
And uh, summarizing, we can say that uh, according to the Elisa of Data, he started in the 60s, and after that in the 80s, uh, uh, we, uh, he started to publish a lot of, about uh, this, uh, this procedure. We have a local response uh, and, of course, uh, a systemic response. Uh, and if you look at this paper, has been published in uh, 2020, you can see that we have an increased blood uh, perfusion and also, uh, and also an increased blood flow in patients uh, who underwent uh, this kind of uh, uh, surgery. <clears throat> so behind the, uh, the, science, uh, the science behind is that we have an increase of many uh, molecules, many uh, important uh, uh, actors in the wound healing process. You can see that the local responses we, we, we have uh, the bone morphogenetic protein, protein uh, increase. BMP is a TGF beta a super family factor. We have an increase of active in type 2. We have an increase of also of the hypoxia inducible factor 1 and vascular endothelial growth factor. So you can see that just in eight minutes, it's quite impossible to uh, sum up all the, all the information. And uh, we have also a systemic response uh, with the mobilization of M uh, MSC, uh, the uh, endothelial presenitor cells, uh, also circulating cytokines, uh, cytokines uh, level changes, and remote bone remodeling. So this is the uh, device. You can see here, this is what you have in your operating uh, theater. If you carry out the surgery from a surgical uh, technique point of view, uh, usually we use a peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, the corticotomy site uh, shall be uh, around five centimeter below the tibia. You can see here a metal guide uh, plate with two holes at the center is inserted into the medial aspect of the tibial by two pins uh, <coughs> using the special TTT fixator as a guide to ensure the other two anchor of pins for the external fixator are in the center line of the tibia shaft. Uh, one centimeter in, in skin incision, usually we perform six incisions uh, are made by are made perpendicular to the guide plate, uh, the slides as shown in this, uh, in this picture, and the corticotomy is created using a custom made three holes drill guide. You can see that we can uh, uh, do the, the holes, uh, and after that uh, we check with the fluoroscopy the central pin position. Then insert the two anchor pins uh, to keep the fixator in place and tighten all the pins and position the fixator well for patient comfort. The multiple drill holes are joined together with the, scal with the scalpel, with the osteotum. Must be, you must be very careful in order to avoid any fracture. And this is the, frame team, uh, the, the um, time frame. Uh, yeah, the total duration of the treatment is uh, one uh, month and a half. Uh, you can see here. After uh, five days, uh, you start to uh, upward uh, the speed of one millimeter per day for, day for 10 days. After that, uh, five days uh, of rest. Uh, and uh, you, after that, uh, put in uh, the uh, original position in 10 days uh, with uh, one millimeter per day, the, the chip of uh, cortex. So coming back to our patient, you can see that we started with this bad situation, 60 millimeters of mercury rest pain uh, with uh, this, uh, uh, this foot. Uh, we uh, carried out the surgery in uh, the end of May, but uh, you can see that in June, uh, we have an increase of the TCPO2, no rest pain. In August, uh, TCPO2 increased a lot. Uh, Again, no pain, and you can see the second toe was almost completely healed and better with the curettage of the first toe. In September, was, this was the situation, and a few days ago, the doctor sent me a picture of the patient. So, we started with this situation with the disease desert foot, uh, and uh, unfortunately, at the end, <laughs> no, don't worry, it's okay. And you can see that uh, with this uh, very bad uh, desert foot, we were able to achieve the goal. In particular, we were able to, uh, uh, to uh, remove 
the rest pain in this patient. So this is the last literature you can see, 2020, 2021. We are at the beginning of the story because this is another option, uh, another release of option for patients uh, with no options. And so if you are interested in this uh, uh, device, you can see that there is uh, a lot of literature in the last uh, few years. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Kulerich. A very interesting technique. This will also incite lots of questions. Uh, I'm honored to present the next speaker, uh, Professor Fadi Michel. Professor Fadi is a known, renowned orthopedic surgeon at Shams University. He's presenting his topic, Innovative Solutions for Difficult Diabetic Food Deformities. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for having me here. Uh, I'm not a vascular surgeon at all. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, works in Enchamps University, and uh, uh, I'm honored to work with the, the Egyptian Diabetic Food Center team headed by our professor, Dr. Rashad Bushara. Uh, it was a great challenge for me to, to go through this uh, field, the diabetic food. It's well known that the orthopedic surgeon hates nothing more than infection. Infection for orthopedic surgeon means disaster. So uh, Dr. Rashad uh, invited me to, to invade this uh, uh, field and it was my pleasure. Okay. Uh, in fact, diabetic arthropathy, this is the, the, the term of the orthopedic term of diabetic foot or diabetic uh, ankle. Uh, the diabetic arthropathy is a group of disorders of both bones and soft tissue that occurred in diabetic patients with peripheral neuropathy and loss of proprioception. Uh, it includes charcot joint arthropathy, joint infection, joint subluxation, joint dislocations, and spontaneous muscle necrosis. In fact, the key of success for any diabetic foot surgery is a multidisciplinary team. And uh, this is uh, what encourages me to, to invade this uh, field that our team includes uh, the very eminent vascular surgeons, diabetic foot surgeons, uh, myself, plastic surgeon, endocrinologist, anesthesiologist, ICU team, and a very well-trained nurses. I will go to some cases directly. Uh, first, we tried the effect of joint fixation for soft tissue healing. It's well known in orthopedics that if you fix it, a mobile joint, the soft tissue over it will heal rapidly. So in, in such a case, this is a 52 years old female with extensive soft tissue infection of the foot and ankle. Uh, I fix it with a very simple technique, a monoplanar fixator on the medial aspect, and our vascular surgeon did the debridement, and this is the result within two months after VAX therapy. The fixation accelerates healing very good for soft tissue. So another case, and this is very common, I think, in your uh, field, the tendo Achilles infection. Uh, loss of tendo Achilles resulted in equinus foot deformity and foot drop deformity. So after healing of the soft tissue, the patient will suffer much from this position of foot. He can't wet bare on a uh, foot with equinus. So by a very simple technique, this is screw. This is called Chan's screw. Sorry. I will this is called Shanza screw. It's a very simple screw that's inserted from the heel upwards to the ankle joint, fixing the ankle joint in 90 degree position until the soft tissue heals. Once the soft tissue heals, the patient will have a plenty great foot to walk upon, not an equinus foot. Also, the fixation of the ankle joint and subtalar joint accelerates the healing of the soft tissue over the tendo Achilles. Is another case of a male patient who's 48 years old with extensive soft tissue infection around the heel. Her bone was totally normal. She has no disruption of the ankle joint or subtalar, but we just fix her with an external fixator to fix the mobile joint. And this was the result. Very good healing within two months by VAC therapy. And I think within three months, she has good skin over her foot. Go to much more complicated cases, which is a staged strategy for management of infected, distracted ankle joint. This is a fact of our protocol in the center that we usually, with infected, distracted ankle joints, we go for a staged operation. The first operation is the of the infected tissue, the of infected bone, 
prepare the bone surfaces for proper joint fixation and fusion, and we use the, at least the minimal fixation, temporary fixation of the joint. Minimal temporary fixation for the joint. The second stage is wound care and wound healing, and the final stage is the permanent joint fixation and fusion. This was our first case. This is a female patient, 53 years old, has insulin-resistant diabetes mellitus. And she has a loose ankle, completely distracted ankle with very huge lateral ulcer, as you see. The bone also is exposed here with this infected ulcer. And the x-ray shows complete destruction of the ankle joint. What we did is, firstly, we would do a lateral debridement for the ulcer. And unfortunately, in the same day of surgery, we were confronted with extensive soft tissue infection and the abscess on, in the medial aspect also. So we have lateral and medial aspect infection of the ankle with complete destruction. We did a, a total debridement for the medial and lateral aspect, and we fixed it with, with that chance screw also. This is screw, a very simple screw. And the patient goes for back therapy for two months, and this was the result. Both soft tissue on both sides were healed. Unfortunately, we have some superficial infection on the chance screw, so we remove the screw and continue just cost, below knee cost, and continue until complete healing of the soft tissue. This is at the day we remove the cost. It's totally complete healing of the soft tissue. And we did a permanent fixation with this simple six and a half millimeter screws. Did the patient foot after three months. This is the x-ray after one year. This is the patient walking with a very stable ankle with a very simple procedure. This is another patient, she's 68 years old. She has an ankle dislocation with huge, large ulcer, and the medial malleus is totally exposed from the medial wound and totally necrosed with infected, dead medial malleus and ankle joints. What we did is just excision of the infected bone, infected soft tissue. We just fix it with a, this, this very simple screw from downward, and we use a cast. This is the wound after we ended our operation. Follow up of the wound with VAC therapy. Take complete healing of the wound, then permanent fixation of the ankle joint. And this is a patient walking on her leg without any infection with a stable ankle joint. This is an example, this 46 years old female patient with failed the fracture fixation. She had a POTS ankle fracture. She was fixed and unfortunately it was infected and destructed and come with this ulcer and draining pus from the wound. We did our staged procedure, but we used the external fixator, monoplanar external fixator with complete realignment of the ankle joint. And after healing of the soft tissue, a very simple procedure for permanent fixation. Unfortunately, three months later, she came with infected ankle fracture. So we removed the screws until complete healing of the soft tissue. We sure there's no infection. We refix her again with simple screws. This is another case with a 50 years old female patient had this plantar ulcer for five years now. It doesn't heal. By x-ray, she has a fracture at the anterior calcaneal process with equinous deformity of the calcaneus. The calcaneus is lying down like that in the ulcer, and the patient is walking on this pony prominence for that she has a great ulcer here. What we did is first we did a tendon Achilles lengthening. We did a tendon Achilles lengthening so can allow to realign the calcaneus. Simply inserted an external screw, the chain screw from posterior to fix the fracture and continue with the cost until complete healing and then fixation with a simple screw and the patient now has no ulcer for around two years. Conclusion, the multidisciplinary team is the key of success of such challenging cases. Case selection is very important. Always expect unhappy events. 
simple procedures and simple implantation increases the rate of success. Thank you. Very nice, very nice presentation. You'll be bombarded with hundreds of questions, Dr. Fadi. Thank you. So the next uh, presentation is actually uh, a recording from uh, Canada. Uh, Dr. P Perry Meyer is chief of diabetic uh, food clinic in um, Ontario, Canada. He's going to introduce uh, this new technology of, uh, to treat diabetic foot ulcers using focused shock wave technology. Uh, please run the video. My name is Dr. Perry Meyer, and I'm the medical director of the Meyer Institute, a center of excellence dedicated to the treatment of diabetic foot in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And I'm here this beautiful morning to talk to you about Dermapaste, uh, which is a shockwave therapy used in the treatment of wounds. So PACE, or Pulse Acoustic Cellular Expression, is the proprietary form of extracorporeal shockwave technology. And this is a, a, a technology that utilizes high energy acoustic pressure waves in the shockwave spectrum created through an electrohydraulic method. PACE energy causes mechanical stress at the surface layer of these cells and it's through this cell deformation or cellular cell uh, wall stress that we believe the biological response comes from uh, in, uh, with dermapaste. So what is the mechani mechanism of action? So PACE increases the local blood flow through angioneogenesis, which is, 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 is sounds uh, sensible. It increases leukocyte transmigration through vessel permeability to allow these particular special cells to get to the wound bed to act on the uh, on the uh, medium. It increases cellular communication, so cytokine upregulation, so cytokines being the signaling elements that are bringing uh, the necessary um, epithelial cells into the wound bed and are responsible for expressing the proteins that, uh, for growth factor production, for instance. And through this, it facilitates wound reduction and wound closure through granulation and reepithelialization via cell migration. So what are its indications for use? Well, in, uh, in the United States, the FDA has um, cleared the use of dermapaste for the treatment of diabetic feet and diabetic foot ulcers. In the rest of the world, it can be used for almost any type of wound, diabetic foot ulcers, obviously, decubitus ulcers, um, ischemic wounds, venous leg ulcers, um, partial thickness burns, uh, operative wounds, and post-traumatic wounds. So who is this for? Now, obviously for diabetics, the, diabetic, the prevalence of diabetes is, is uh, well known throughout the world. It is higher in certain locales, and certainly in the Middle East and Egypt in particular, the prevalence is high. And of those individuals with diabetes in the Middle East, 75% are uncontrolled. And of those, 25% will suffer a foot wound uh, in their lifetime. And we know that those that go on to amputation, 85% of those are preceded by a diabetic foot wound. And unfortunately, the mortality rate is extraordinarily high amongst these individuals and are um, uh, approaches and the mortality rates approaches 70% after five years. It's a tremendously high mortality rate. So what is our evidence? In 2007, we did, the, there was a level one, uh, level one evidence. In 2007, um, a double-blinded, multi-sender, randomized control trial was done. I was part of that. It was a very painful study to be part of because we had to enroll a lot of people, um, but it was randomized, double-blinded, and multi-centered. That put a lot of pressure on us, but the results were quite uh, surprising and spectacular. Um, it was found that 90% wound area reduction occurred over six weeks using um, this form of uh, wound therapy. And what is most important about this um, pivotal study was that the inclusion criteria for these uh, individuals 
uh, included comorbidities with, that other clinical investigations would normally exclude. In 2018, uh, the level one evidence was peer reviewed and substantiated and validated. So these results are real world results. These studies, the study re results reported on demographic groups that are usually excluded from any of our uh, wound, uh, diabetic wound studies. And we know the inclusion criteria and there, this, these individuals fell well outside of those. These are true life subjects, obese patients. The average BMI for our patients was over 32. The majority of the patients had uncontrolled blood sugars with uh, about 68% um, with blood sugar A1Cs over 7%. 50% of our patients were moderate to heavy cigarette smokers. And the care that they received out in the field, although was well-intentioned standard of care, it varied from locale to locale. But even with those uh, uh, types of patients, the results um, were spectacular. Now, level two evidence comes in the form of a study that was done by a colleague uh, of ours, Wendy Cole, out of Kent State. And she was looking at um, extracorporeal shockwave therapy in the, and, and how it affected tissue oxygenation in chronic wounds with, uh, in people with diabetes. And what is important about her study is that she used the same study design that uh, the, the, the pilot study was uh, included. That being, it included the same population, the real world population. And in this study, she demonstrated an increase in tissue oxygenation, an increase in perfusion and capillary density, an increase in growth factors, and a 70% decrease in overall surface area after five weeks, but more spectacular, almost 50% complete closure in under five weeks in uh, a certain subset of her patients. So what, let's take a look at how that affected perfusion, how dermapase affected perfusion in these diabetic wounds. Um, Dr. Cole had 15 subjects with chronic uh, diabetic wounds that had failed to um, achieved the standard wound area reduction after four weeks that underwent four separate weekly uh, treatments of dermapase. And then the uh, tissue oxygenation was measured using near infrared spectroscopy. And the reports were um, very uh, encouraging. All of the wounds demonstrated a decrease in wound area and almost half of them completely healed all within four weeks. And most significantly here is that all wounds displayed a statistically significant increase in tissue oxygenation. This is a tremendous effect uh, from this uh, treatment modality. So what is our uh, clinical case evidence? So we're going to take a look at a few cases demonstrating uh, the effectiveness of dermapase on chronic wounds, generally underperfused, but uh, are in a chronic stalled state. So this is a patient from our, the pilot study um, who was one of my patients whom we had been treating for many, many months prior, who went on to distal ischemia with distal gangrene and multiple toe amputations. The middle uh, three toes were amputated last and they uh, resulted in an open wound that was not uh, closing with uh, standard of care and advanced wound treatment modalities. This uh, patient received dermapase um, and over a 15 week period had complete closure. And this is in context of a patient like this who was really not progressing over many, many months, at least 12 to 15 weeks prior that had the wound restarted and uh, go on to complete closure. Now, this is a paper that we, uh, we produced for Wounds Canada in 2020, I believe, and it demonstrated the effect of dermapase on incision line healing and peri-wound uh, edema reduction. And we found that um, 
that the, the healing time uh, for annealing of the incision lines was cut in half, and the wound area, of uh, the, the peri wound uh, edema reduction was significant, although we had no real way to measure that except for subjective measures, which we reported on in the, in the poster. And finally, this is a, a, a wound um, that was managed by a, a great colleague of ours in uh, San Antonio, Texas, Anna Sanchez. And this is a, 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 a heel wound, which we all know are very, very problematic in healing. It had been, uh, Anna had been struggling with this for many months prior. And she then embarked on a weekly course of um, dermapace. And over the next nine weeks, from the picture on the left to the one on the right is nine week span, she had a 75% wound area reduction. But what is significant is that the morphology of the wound is completely different in the, in the uh, uh, picture on the right with a very superficial, easily healed wound, which is well on its way um, to closure and has a very positive healing trajectory. And this was all um, as a result of the introduction of dermapaste and nothing else. So these are very compelling results. So in conclusion, we want to talk about the challenge of wound healing and where we focus our attention. And wound clinicians in general typically tend to look at the surface of the wound when really we need to look below the wound bed. We need to look deeper into the wound and see whether we can manipulate uh, those elements to help us heal these very problematic wounds. The problem lies below the wound bed at the microvascular level. And dermapace, we've shown, is a proven focused technology that reaches below the, the, the wound bed surface to treat that microvasculature, to manipulate it and promote it, to allow it to proliferate and uh, nourish the wound bed, not only with blood flow, but with other, the other elements like cytokines, growth factors, etc. I thank you so much for listening, and I hope that uh, this has stimulated your mind to utilize this treatment modality in, in many ways, but it is a versatile uh, technology that really has just scratched the surface and we want to go beneath that surface. I hope that uh, we can have a, a discussion later. If you have questions, I'd be more than happy to speak to you about them. Thank you again. Yeah, interesting technology, Dr. Meyer, unfortunately cannot be with us because it's 3 a.m. Uh, in Canada. So we can write to him questions maybe. Now it gives me a paramount honor to present Professor Dr. Rashad Bashara, the head and the founder of the Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at the General Organization of Teaching Hospitals and Institutes. Dr. Rashad is also known being the founder of the Egyptian African Venus and Lymphatic Association, Ivla. Please, sir, be waiting for your kind presentation. Once again, uh, thank you, Professor Nasser Said uh, and the organizing committee for the privilege. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about something that might look uh, a little bit boring, and that is painful neuropathy. I have no disclosures related to this particular presentation. And why should I talk about neuropathy to a community of vascular surgeons? Because neuropathy is so common. It affects 21 to 25% of our patients. And in our practice, a full 24% of the patients come presenting with this mainly. Obviously, it affects their quality of life. Uh, they are unable to sleep. Uh, it gives a lot of foot pain, pins and needles, and numbness. And maybe that's because why they come to us, vascular surgeons, because they don't feel their feet and they think it's bad circulation. And of course, we all know uh, neuropathy predisposes to ulcers. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with this complex pathology, but painful neuropathy could appear before the diagnosis of type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Uh, the standard treatment, uh, um, as documented in the, the British NICE guidelines, is glycemic control and medications, anti-epileptic medications and antidepressant medications in, step, in stepwise manner. The majority of patients who come to us have already experienced these um, uh, medications and it failed to control the symptoms. 
So I'd like to introduce to you to this relatively new technology, FREMS. FREMS is Frequency Rhythmic Electrical Modulation System. It's a not drug, a non-drug option to treat the painful, uh, the pain of painful neuropathy. And it basically, it consists of a series of electric, electrical currents, electrical stimulation. It produces electromagnetic waves, uh, the objective of, ways of which is to alleviate the pain of painful neuropathy. What's the clinical evidence? There has been four studies, um, about 151 patients, three RCTs, and one case control studies. All the studies used the same device, and all of them were performed in Europe. And this is the most important one of which uh, it consists of uh, 110 patients which were randomized into FREMS versus placebo. And you can see from the charts here, um, the, uh, uh, the first chart on the top is for uh, night pain and the bottom chart is for uh, daytime pain. Uh, the white dots are for the placebo while the black dots are for the treatment group. So, uh, as you can see, that's before treatment and that's after treatment, and that's week 12, 24, 36, etc. Uh, this is the group who had placebo, and this is the group who had FREMS technology, and there is uh, a significant difference uh, in pain uh, between the two groups. So, there is significant reduction in pain in the FREMS group, both at night time and at day time. Uh, uh, and accordingly, uh, this technology was accepted in the uh, British National Health System, and this is the statement, Aptiva, which is, the French, uh, which is the French technology, would be used in addition to or as a placement for pharmacological treatment if this fails. So this is our experience with the French technology. We reviewed our experience in the past three years, from January 2019 to January 2023. Uh, we included patients if they were 18 years or older, uh, if they have painful neuropathy or severe numbness, they couldn't feel their feet, and they had diabetes that's diagnosed and documented for greater than one year, and they were on stable uh, neuropathy medications, which I just described for a minimum of six months regularly, and they had an EMG showing diabetic polyneuropathy and um, documented absence of ischemia peripheral ischemia. Uh, we did not include patients who had ulcers or who had pacemakers because this technology could interfere with the function of pacemakers. The FREMS, the FREMS protocol is quite simple. Uh, eight electrodes are applied to the skin of, the, of both legs uh, and the therapist increases the electrical dose until the patient feels the pulses but without feeling pain as a result of the pulses. The treatment continues for 35 minutes and is repeated every day for 10 successive days. And uh, we measured the results according to a visual analog scale. So uh, a score of one means no pain, a score of five means severe pain. We explained the visual analog, spare to, uh, analog scale to the patients and we asked them to scare, to, sorry, to uh, assess their own pain uh, every session. We also we used the same score for numbness and we asked the patient to assess his own numbness um, according to this scale in every session. And uh, these are the results. So it's a three years retrospective review. It included 321 patients. The mean age was 57, 59% were male and 223, that 69 of the patients could respond adequately, adequately to the visual analog score. The other patient did not understand or did not respond. And these are the results. And as you remember, five is the maximum. So five is, in, is very severe pain. And this is the average pain score. So initially, uh, the average pain score of the whole group was 4.7. And um, in the uh, session number 10, it was 3.1. And I'd like to remind you that the minimum is one. Um, and again, uh, this is the percent of patients who uh, scored five. Uh, that severe pain. So 81% of the patient um, um, perceived severe pain at the beginning uh, of the treatment, while at the end of the treatment only 10%. And to our great surprise, and this is not documented in the literature, this technology also improved the numbness um, the, the, and the feeling of anesthesia in the periphery. So at the beginning, again, this, there was severe um, anesthesia. This is the average I would say numbness score, and this is the average numbness score 
at the end um, of the 10 sessions. Again, uh, those patients uh, perceive their numbness as very severe, so 82% at the beginning, um, as compared to 11% at uh, session number 10. We also asked the patient uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of the treatment, we asked the patient we, uh, to score how much improvement did he feel in his pain or his numbness. So uh, a few patient, uh, oops, I'm sorry, a few patient, sorry about this, a few patient uh, said zero, no improvement, and um, a few patient said completely gone, the symptoms, but the majority of patients uh, fell between 40%, 50%, 60%, and 70% improvement. And the average improvement for the whole group was 51%. So uh, that this means if you ask the patient how much improvement did you feel, the average was 50%. Um, and there was no side effects at all. And this is our conclusion that FREMS technology proved to be safe uh, and it's effective symptomatic treatment for the majority of patients presenting with painful neuropathy. And uh, currently we are doing a long-term study to see how long the improvement continues. Thank you for listening. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexander Lazarov for his second presentation, Computer Vision Strategy and Applications in Medical Practice. Hi, everybody, again. The AI story is about to continue. We are about to comment on and discuss the computer vision as application in the medical practice. So let's start with the essence of uh, the computer vision. It is a purely virtual data exchange activity which is dedicated to mod monitoring of uh, targeted uh, quickly moving objects or fast developing processes extracting data from them and developing a mathematical model. Further comes uh, data manipulation via mathematical processing to explore possible outcomes in diverse conditions. Then comes uh, hypothesis generation, generation of uh, predictions and their performance. And the most challenging uh, feature here is that apparently AI is already autom automatically memorizing its experience. It's a great debate whether uh, this should be recognized as knowledge or not. Something uh, very essential here regarding medical diagnostics, uh, as far as the activity is uh, entirely related and limited to data exchange and information exchange, uh, this means that uh, unless there is uh, some robotic uh, periphery involved to intervene, in any event, uh, the uh, AI does not bring any risk to your patients. Here are the principal methods which uh, uh, computer vision applies. Uh, first, this is uh, single or multi-spectrum monitoring, uh, image outcome overlap and comparison. Second comes uh, finite element mathematical analysis. And third is in cases of uh, figured out self-similarity, calculating the coefficient of diversity. In a minute, I'll give examples uh, from the three methods uh, to better understand them. And uh, uh, you must know that they may be uh, applied uh, uh, individually or sometimes in a set. So what is the strategy? What is the benefit from uh, uh, using, applying computer vision? First of all, it discloses invisible uh, processes and activities that we don't know. Second, it recognizes many details and peculiarities within these advancements that we humans cannot do. Remember the example of iris recognition. 
Then, uh, computer vision uh, uh, produces the uh, estimated uh, process development and allows its influencing by mathematical uh, means uh, to explore various options. And essentially, it allows numerous runs in time, forward and backward, so you can try test various experimentations on how to influence the outcome. And finally, uh, before the uh, examples, I want to spare a minute about the diversity between AI and the computer program as far as computer vision is exploited also by some computer programs. If a software expert uh, has to develop a computer program, it contains a lot of uh, rules, laws, procedures, orders, etc. And uh, his mission is to tell the computer system run from uh, uh, stage A to stage B. And depending on the result B1, then proceed further to C1, B2 to C2, uh, B3 to C3, etc. Mm -hmm. However, in case the software is the, did not predict any possible uh, outcome, the program blocks. Example, you receive a letter that is written uh, under a Microsoft Word program, but you don't have installed the necessary font that uh, the, program, uh, the letter was written in. So in this case, you have on the display only some symbols that you cannot understand or some simply squares. This is the program block. So now, here are the uh, examples. So the first one is dedicated to venous disease uh, uh, treatment and to an investigation, what is uh, the blood tension that the vein valve and the vein vein can hold. Uh, the idea is to introduce a time component so both uh, the medical expert and the patient uh, will know how long uh, the surgical or other intervention can be delayed. It is a project under uh, development at the Bulgarian, uh, uh, in B Bulgarian Academy of Sciences Mathematical Department and my wife who is a vascular surgeon uh, and Dr. Elena Goranova, she is sitting here, is involved to this uh, initiative. Here you have the finite element analysis example. Mm -hmm. This is the case of uh, abdominal aneurysm uh, uh, examinations and the rupture risk assessment. Uh, all of you know how important it is to uh, be aware whether you have to run immediately to the surgical room once your patient uh, has arrived or you have some time to get prepared, etc. So on the right picture you see uh, black uh, squares of uh, black neck and each piece of that is a finite element that is mathematically studied uh, individually and in a set with its neighbor. So the prediction is developed. Uh, what is uh, most uh, substantial for uh, the finite element exploration is the image resolution because the higher the resolution is, the number of the net pieces is greater and therefore the probability of the prediction is much, much higher. Here is something that is directly related to the topic of this session. This is the computer image exploration of diabetic food. In this case, AI applies uh, uh, red, blue, and green visible spectrum imaging in a set with uh, infrared, the thermal spectrum, and uh, the uh, images comparison and overlap allows uh, to make a, a prog prognosis about whether ulcers will appear and how soon this will happen. And finally, this is uh, a very challenging approach. This is the calculating the coefficient of self-similarity. I have to introduce Benoit Mandelbrot, a famous mathematician who was employed by IBM for longer than 30 years last century. 
Mandel brought uh, claimed and proved that uh, classical mathematics cannot deal with uh, self-similarity because uh, it deals with uniform units. Well, uh, he developed the fractal theory saying that self-similar pieces that uh, seem similar but no, are not equivalent uh, can be studied by calculating the coefficient of uh, the diversity. Uh, example of uh, fractals are the leaves of a tree, the drops in the cloud, the cells in any uh, biological organism tissue. So what's the benefit? Uh, once you examine such a tissue, let's say human lung or some other organ, in case in some area this coefficient uh, comes out to be diverse than the general one, this already means that there has started a degenerative process. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lazarov. Uh, uh, again, it gives me a great honor and pleasure to uh, re-invite Professor uh, Giacomo Gerucci uh, for a wonderful presentation entitled Tips and Tricks in Food Surgery After Food Vein Arterialization, a new concept in food surgery.